Hello, everybody. And uh, I'm Claudio Ruiz. Um, I'm the director of ecosystem strategy at Creative Commons, and I will. I'm honored to give you the warm welcome to the Global Summit. This is not the first session, though. We had a couple of sessions uh, yesterday. Some others, night my time, and and today being 9 a.m. my time, 2 p.m. Cairo, 3 p.m. Beirut, and whatnot. I'm really happy to present you this first keynote for today. Uh, Tuesday the 20th. Uh, it's called A Culture of Peace, and I'm really, really happy to introduce our four speakers, uh, which are Bashra Ibadi, uh, Deepak Ramola, Leonardo Parraga, and Asha Siad. Um, so that's it. I'm going to leave the stage. The floor is yours. And welcome again. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our session. I'm really excited to be joined by uh, Deepak, uh, Leonardo, and Oscar today. Yeah, so um, I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of context before we jump into some of the stories that each of our uh, panelists will be sharing with us. So in terms of our global strategy, plenary just a piece um, an agency of marginalized individuals and communities around the world um, and uh, my connection with um, culture is um, a pretty deep one so when I um, think about peace building in particular um, for uh, me my background is as a, a child of refugees and in particular as a first generation Afghan Canadian um, I've uh, really uh, been attuned to the impact that culture has in enabling communities to come together and develop resiliency in the face of uh, conflict um, and um, uh, other um, disasters or inequities. And um, something that um, really resonated with me as, as I was growing up was this idea of being able to connect with each other um, through our culture. And so culture in its different forms. Um, access to culture was a key indicator. Um, so when I was um, growing up, learning about uh, the destruction in Buddhism in particular, for example, uh, was deeply unsettled by that and um, understanding how um, the destruction of culture was being used as a tool of oppression, um, as a tool of colonization, as a tool um, to really advance um, inequity and marginalize communities, especially communities that were being made vulnerable by these uh, systems of oppression. Um, so uh, much for the last few years has focused on the role of culture in supporting peace building and in particular looking at this um, notion of openness and how uh, contexts um, openness um, in fact has been limited as a uh, um, by colonial um, to be open um, the agency of around the world and really um, understanding the value of different um, expertise, um, different knowledges um, and different cultures. Um, so um, with that, I'll kind of jump into the session and invite um, our first speaker, um, Deepak, to um, present um, uh, about his experiences um, as it relates to um, really how um, he's been developing peace through open culture, open access, and um, open knowledge. And before I, I guess um, I invite Deepak to intervene, I also wanted to take this time to acknowledge um, the many Indigenous um, communities around the world who are Christian, um, and um, to really ask our audience to center um, the, the agency of these marginalized communities, whether it's Indigenous communities, Black communities, people of African descent, Asian descent, um, South Central um, American descent and Caribbean descent, um, and the work that we're doing, um, and not really um, further marginalize them in, in um, of building peace and building equity. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Deepak, um, the founder and artistic director of Proud Fuel, and I'll, I'll let him speak a little bit more about um, his background and experiences. Hello, everybody. Uh, good evening from uh, all the way from India uh, in the mountains. I just wanted to recheck if everyone can hear me clear. Uh, if yes, please drop in a yes on the chat box. I can, I can track with you and take you through my work. My work is uh, titled Project Fuel. Wonderful. Thank you for that confirmation, Mary. 
My organization is called Project Fuel, and what we do is we document, design, and pass on human wisdom from all around the world. For the last 11 years, I have been collecting learning knowledge from around the world through people's lives and stories. And the, the entire premise of this work actually started inspired by my mother who was pulled out of school in grade five by her grandmother who didn't want her to go to a school and study with boys. So my mother never had the opportunity and the resources to learn in a very formal education setup. I would say she was the first beneficiary of the open access and open knowledge culture because my mother learned through the learning that people very uh, openly, open-heartedly and generously shared in the community and as she grew up across the world. What that did for her, her was it turned the entire world into a classroom. And let me just show you a quick picture of, of, of my mother in a, in a moment. Uh, if, you can, if you can see my slide. Yeah. So that's my mother, who um, is, is my inspiration for this work and has uh, created a lot of, a lot of my uh, projects and its bandwidth and its backbone. When I think of open access in building peace, you can hear me now, right? So Max Mohammed, yes, wonderful. When we talk about building open access, from the Indian context, but particularly, I would say all of our learnings that we've had, with, whether it's religious texts, whether it is learning through our ethics, our uh, holy books, all of that knowledge is very much open access. In fact, to give you an example, one of the most famous epics of Indian ancient wisdom is a book called Mahabharata which was composed by Vedvyas and written by Lord Ganesha. Most people believe across the world that Vedvyas is a person who composed the book. But I'm happy to tell you, Vedvyas is actually a position. The 27th Vedvyas, his name was Krishna Dwipayan, wrote or composed the Mahabharata. But many people even in India don't know that. And that is because in Indian ancient and contemporary wisdom philosophies believe that learning is nobody's copyright as to say. It is an inclination, a piece of awareness that you come across through your experiences and that experience can be shared by somebody else, that learning can come through someone else. But because it comes through you, you have the right and responsibility to make sure that it reaches many, many different people around the world. In that scenario, also, what happens is that we create more knowledge, more learning, and also allow other people to use that knowledge, not just as our um, important tool, but other people's resources also. I also wanted to share with you that I collect human stories and life lessons of people. And in 2016, I was on a integration tour of Syrian refugees in Europe. I was working with academic and non-academic organizations uh, in, in Europe. And uh, I think I can quickly share uh, my screen with you. With these Syrian refugees, uh, I documented their learning and I designed them into educational curriculum that could be used. We even took it to the UN. But across the tour, I realized that there were many things I needed access to or I needed to learn to be able to negate, um, you know, perceptions that were refugee hating groups or that built on to a traditional or a conventional mindset of how refugee integration could look like. And so with these people, what we were able to do was use knowledge that was made freely accessible by communities uh, across, by, uh, you know, European countries as tools for refugee integration. So these were statistics, these were analysis of refugee integration, these were reports by government agencies. Because they were out in the public domain, we were able to use them to design the curriculums 
to integrate Syrian refugees and subsequently refugees from Eritrea and Africa in five countries or, of Europe that I was working on. So primarily what I'm trying to emphasize on is somebody who works with human wisdom, somebody who works with learnings and stories. I can tell you that these perspectives, when they're openly available for the world to use in fair capacity, allow for newer innovation, allow for experimentation in educational policies, allow for inventiveness in art projects, and also allow for us to be able to create something that is having a larger legacy, that is having a longer uh, shelf life, so to say, in its dynamic and uh, evolving approach. The other thing that I've learned about how you can use open knowledge in building a peaceful culture is that till the time you don't put one of the Creative Commons, uh, you know, indicative mark onto your document or your information, or till you don't sign an official contract, there is often room for negotiation and people forget that. Till the time you haven't signed a legal document, there is room to negotiate what you are comfortable with. And so do not give in or subscribe to a pressure that allows you to take away your rights, allows you to not benefit from it economically or socially or judicially throughout your research uh, is something that people need to keep in mind. And lastly, I would like to share something from a personal experience. We've been working on a project recently called the World Wisdom Map, where we are creating a digital world map documenting life lessons of people from all the 195 countries in the world. In the process of building this digital map, I came across the tool of digital humanities because the project didn't fit into education, art, media as a domain. And so I wanted to learn about digital humanities open access cultures of libraries like the Howard uh, Library or the Google Books were so helpful in helping me understand and learn what digital humanities is, what that scholarship means, how to use it, and then subsequently build this project. So both from a beneficiary perspective and a benefactor perspective, I think sharing this wisdom with people through an open access uh, platform and manner and coming back from the Indian ancient roots of acknowledging the work has been very, very beneficial for me and has allowed me enough room for creativity. Um, and in the end, I would say that, you know, the Greek uh, wisdom is based upon logic. The Chinese wisdom is based upon duality, the yin and the yang. The Indian wisdom is based upon the inner awareness the atmagyan, the awareness of the spirit or the soul and the learnings that come through it. Yet in all these different learning instruments and cultures of the world, there's one common thread running through each of it, that knowledge must be passed on like a full grown tree or must be looked from the perspective of a full blown forest. So that when somebody wants to enter through um, you know, a, a tree root, they have access to it. And when they want to pull back and see the forest, they have access to it. And you and I hold the power to create that experience for them. So I, I wish you all the best. And my fellow panelists will tell you more about their work and the wonderful insights they share. So thank you, Bushra. And thank you, everybody, for listening. So much, deep sharing um, the incredible work that you're doing and of this idea of connecting um, knowledge with, um, you know, the idea of a tree and um, really looking at how it's deeply rooted um, in our respective communities, really that and allowing it to flourish. And so um, really co like collectively working together to grow these um, gardens or communities together. Um, uh, for our next um, uh, speaker, um, I would like to invite um, Asha uh, Saya as an award winning small documentary filmmaker. Her experience, um, the intersection between open culture and open access, um, and the work that she's um, been doing um, on really 
um, supporting and expanding dialogue um, around uh, underreported uh, stories um, of especially marginalized communities, including um, displaced people. Um, and people who are conflict affected. Um, she created Memories of Mogadishu, which is a project that she will be sharing with us today that examines the use of the destruction of a once cosmopolitan city um, by the Somali di diaspora around the world. Um, uh, with, without further ado, um, Asha, I'd like to invite you to... Uh... Thank, thank you, Bushra. I'm just gonna share my screen. Please let me know if you can all see it and if you can hear my presentation as well issues with um, um, so while we get that sorted out um, I'll invite um, Leonardo to um, share his story with us and I'll give a little bit of an introduction to Leonardo as well um, so Leonardo is a global citizen acting in a local context um, a Colombian activist who believes in the value of systemic change through peace happiness and love um, with his team at the Bogotá Arts Foundation, they created a more democratic art world, um, one artwork uh, at a time. And he is also serving as a youth ambassador of the Peace Palace and is a winner of the Youth Carnegie Peace Prize and One Billion Act Hero Award. Um, Leonardo, I'm excited for you to share some of your work with us. Thank you, Bushra. Thanks for that nice introduction. Uh, can you all hear me? Can you give me a yes on the chat? Okay, great. That's amazing. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited to, to share this space with you and take on what Deepak was sharing with you all and that importance of sharing knowledge and making knowledge available uh, as a way to, to create peace. So I start this story with how I got involved into peace building uh, as a young person. So it was back in 2016, and in Colombia, we were having a referendum to approve uh, the peace agreement that was going on in Colombia at that moment. And it was the first time that I, that I started to get more engaged with what peace in my country was. It, it was the first time that uh, the peace agreement was made available for everyone um, and that it was widely shared so by by having access to to this document it was a 300 pages long document um i was able to know what was that future that we were foreseeing as a country how we wanted to deal with the conflict that we were experiencing yet even if it was open access there was a big difficulty. Uh, first, uh, most of the population, they will not be willing to, to read a 300 pages document. And then secondly, the complexity of the text was such that a normal person will then be able to, to grasp what was the sense of it. So at the moment with a couple of young people, what we started to do was um, to start to talk about what was the peace agreement. So we went to the open space. We went to the main squares in, in Colombia, started to say, look, here's what the peace agreement is all about. It will influence these C six key areas. And, and through that, we, we will be able to transition from using weapons to get power uh, to using words to build policies and and that was a really interesting exercise because through this open dialogue through this dissemination of knowledge uh, we were able to see first how pervasive were fake news uh, and how people were telling stories about uh, that were not even contained in the in the peace agreement that were disencouraging them to to vote in favor of it so that was one big part but then the second part when you start to have a dialogue and when you start to have a dialogue with people who don't share your views that really opens up a space uh for understanding and a space for for you to to start to imagine what will be that future of your country 
what, what we saw here was that even if people were not willing um, to acknowledge that, yeah, we need peace in this particular way, they were able to imagine how a common future will be like and brainstorm some ideas. So that's the first point I, I wanted to make, that open knowledge and making this knowledge as available as possible to people is a way for peace to to become mainstream and it's a way for everyone to to feel that they have ownership on peace then as a part of this exercise uh, we saw that there was a lot of polarization and that people were not really willing to talk with some others who who share really different views and and we saw this as an element that was the root cause of the conflict that we're experiencing in the country as well. For us, it was necessary to, to start to, to create this, this dialogue. And we started with an exercise called Cartas por la Reconciliación, Letters for Reconciliation. This was uh, a project exchanging letters between former combatants and citizens in which they share their perspective about the conflict, in which they share how they feel about the war we have experienced in, in Colombia, but also they share the perspective of what's the country that they imagine and, and what can they do to, to contribute to that new country that they envision. In this exercise, we were able to exchange more than 5,000 letters, handwritten letters. And for me, it was a great impact to, to generate these new channels uh, of communication, to, to let this knowledge uh, reach out to people at the margins. What happened was that when, when people started to see that they have many commonalities, many shared views uh, with people who were supposedly on the other side of the spectrum, uh, they started to drop their guard and they started to, to engage in a more humane way. And by, by doing so, they, they were able to notice how in this uh, exercise, um, they were able to, to think about uh, a new future. And I give you uh, a couple of quick examples. Um, the first was a um, girl from uh, from Santander, the killer child. In, in her letter, she was writing that uh, her whole family uh, was assassinated by the guerrilla. And she was carrying this pain her whole life. And she was willing for them to to suffer, she she was willing that that they will pay for for what they done. Um, but then, when when she was writing the letter, she realized I've been carrying all this hatred within me. But it's like if I'm drinking poison, waiting for you to die. I I realize that this doesn't make much sense, and and I want to forgive you now because I know that the only way we can move forward with the conflict is when we are able to forgive and when we are able to, to work together generating that new tissue in society. So this example was really heartwarming for me because it shows that no matter how much pain, how much suffering you have endured, there's still room to collaborate with others. And for me, that's something that really goes in the, in the spirit of, of creative commons, how we can start to co-create this piece and how we can make these lessons available. So with all these letters that were written, uh, we started to, to get them published in national and international media. And it became an inspiration for many people to start to have conversation and to start to write messages to, 
dudes who normally don't share their same views. So that's the, the second lesson that when you create this medium for exchange, for communication, um, and it is open and then other people can, can know what's happening there, um, it can push forward uh, a conversation to, to build peace together. And then my third point uh, is regarding how important it is uh, to have knowledge available in the local languages. Uh, so for five years now, we have been developing the youth peace and security agenda. It is uh, an agenda that acknowledges that young people are key players when it comes to transforming violent conflict. Uh, but we don't need to remain only as victims or perpetrators of war, uh, but we are active builders of peace. And by acknowledging young people in this role, we can really start to invest more resources and develop projects where young people's potentials are tapped for peace to, to emerge in their local communities. The, the main problem with this agenda was that it was happening uh, mainly in English. All this content was mainly available in English. And as such, it was generating problems for local communities in different parts of the world to really be able to make the best use of this content. Uh, one such example is in Latin America. In Latin America, uh, people were not getting access to, to this content, to this conversation. And then we decided to, to create a space called Juventudes por la Paz, Youth for Peace. Uh, which is start to, to talk about more about this initiative, which is starts to talk about more how we can collaborate across countries. Um, and recently we, we launched a freestyle competition uh, where people were able to, to do some rap about the, the importance of peace in our communities. Uh, and through that, um, the message uh, that we as as young people can uh, do creative activities we as young people can be key players in in our community started to to strengthen and with this role uh, we saw how more and more people uh, from many different countries start started to to come together and it generated as well a space to notice that uh, the problems that we have in Latin America, like uh, violence against young people, police brutality, a lot of economic inequality. These were shared problems in all our region. And by coming together and starting this dialogue, uh, we were able to brainstorm solutions that, yes, we're, we're having this um, regional approach, uh, but we're adaptable to the local context. And in starting this process, um, we saw how knowledge can be transformative uh, when it is adapted to, to local communities. So those are the three main points I wanted to share with you all. Uh, and I hope that uh, we can move forward uh, having in mind how young people are key players to, to build peace uh, and make a, a conscious effort to, to open up this, this space. Uh, and as Deepak was mentioning, um, we not only need to, to see the roots of the tree, but the whole uh, forest. And, and to be able to do so, uh, we need to have young people at the center of peace building as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bushra, and my lovely panelists for sharing their insights. Thank you so much, Leonardo. Um, I really love um, how you centered young people in the work that you're doing, um, especially as a group that has been um, historically marginalized from these spaces of decision making and governance. And um, I think that the projects that you shared um, definitely serve as a model for um, how important it is to engage people in a way that um, fosters 
greater access um, and access beyond like the availability of information. So localizing knowledge is really important, um, making sure that it's, um, you know, uh, co-created and co-developed by people um, instead of something that's imported into communities. Um, with that, I'm going to make another attempt and we'll see if we can get Asha to share um, some of the work that she's doing with us. Um, hopefully it works this time around. Asha. Thank you, Bushra. I have so many technical issues today. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So I'm just going to turn my presentation on and Bushra, let me know if you can still hear me while I speak. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, can you still hear me? Yep. Excellent. Good morning and hello from Ottawa, Canada. Thank you to CC Global Summit and Bushra Ibadi for organizing this keynote. My name is Asha Siad and I am a documentary filmmaker and creative storyteller. As a media professional, I strongly believe that it is vital to explore narratives in a way that create positive changes and generates understanding. Stories have the ability to impact the way people see the world and themselves. This is why I strive to make my documentary film work accessible to all audiences. Over the years, my projects have centered around social justice issues, served to not only educate the general public about the issues at hand, but to also encourage people to see themselves as global citizens. When populations hear, see, and listen to the same narratives about them in mainstream media, then stories have the potential to harm. Oftentimes, these are the only stories accessible to the general public. But today, that is changing with technology and social media. Diverse storytellers have opportunities to shape these perceptions and counter negative narratives by creating their own media platforms. This is fostering a more collaborative, innovative, and open cultural exchange of new narratives. But it is also an invitation to revisit old narratives as well. My most recent project examines the use of memory in the reconstruction of a once cosmopolitan city by the Somali diaspora around the world. As written in Shireen Ramzanali Faisal's book, Far From Mogadishu, Mogadishu is a city that exists in the stories of its inhabitants. Now displaced in various parts of the world and only thanks to their memories can it be reconstructed. Despite the mainstream media portrayal of Somalia, as a place of violence, destitution, and death. For those who are part of Shireen's generation, their homeland is far from those news media images that we so often see. They have countless stories from long days spent at the beach, enjoying ice lollies, to catching a movie in one of the city's many open air theaters. Mogadishu is preserved in their minds and in their stories. Through the use of oral history in combination with archival footage and personal interviews with members of the Somali diaspora around the world, the goal of the project is to document the collective memory of the pre-Civil War city. At its core, Memories of Mogadishu seeks to build a collaborative storytelling platform for the Somali diaspora around the world to share their memories of Mogadishu with the hope of contributing to reconstruction, reconciliation, and healing of Somali people. Although people may experience a common war and resulting migration, individual stories can reveal the complexities of experiences. The individual stories that are told together demonstrate the rebuilding process and the various reflections along the way. How does the Somali diaspora remember or reimagine Mogadishu? What stories are accessible and open? These are some of the questions I asked nine members of the Somali Canadian diaspora in Ottawa, Canada. As they shared their stories, the result turned into a short documentary film that is available for viewing online. By taking place in, inside of a photo studio, the short film offers an intimate portrait and unprecedented glimpse into the lives of those who have been forcibly displaced by conflict. This initiative is a small contribution to the documentary heritage work led by diaspora communities today. As I mentioned previously, 
emerging technologies have contributed to creating spaces where these diaspora communities are represented and documented digitally. The emergence of online archives creates opportunities for cultures to be open and accessible. With the recent COVID-19 pandemic, the demand for open culture will only increase as we are taking more stories online. As Lisa Nijiru writes in A Modest Reconciliation, owning and caring for stories calls for re reorientation and recovery work among the many of us who have been led to believe such stories do not matter. This has led to the creation of online archives for communities that may not have been represented in mainstream archives. According to the Memory of the World Secretariat uh, at UNESCO, the digitization of documentary heritage material not only decreases barriers to access, but it also expands geographic scope and creates a space for increased participation by communities and scholarly groups. For diaspora communities, this presents opportunities to engage with documentary heritage material, therefore fostering innovation, creativity, shared stewardship, and diversity. Um, so with that, I'll kind of go into um, some of the questions I have, uh, and I'll start with um, you, Asha, since we just um, were privy to some of the important work that you're doing. and being able to share the experiences of uh, members of um, the Somali diaspora and other um, marginalized communities who've been uprooted or displaced. Um, so uh, one aspect of the work that you're doing is um, uh, in creating these documentaries is in archiving um, culture and heritage that's often devalued and rendered invisible in mainstream institutions, and in particular in a way that isn't voyeuristic, um, which is a problem that we definitely, I think, need to collectively address. Um, so what motivated you to, to do this Thank work? Thank you, Bushra, for this great question. So my parents came to Canada as refugees from Somalia during the war. Most of the stories that uh, younger Somali diaspora generations are aware of is mainstream stories about the war and, and, and really what, what Somali people lost as a collective society due to the conflict. I wanted to explore a different side of the story and also to work with the older generation to help them preserve their history and to share it with Somali youth so that they can have a better understanding of Mogadishu and of Somalia as a whole. Um, and um, also, uh, of course, like some of the histories are, 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 are um, invisible. So I wanted to support uh, bringing these issues to light, um, such as collective storytelling and, and the importance of memory, uh, and then hopefully working with, um, or, uh, working with libraries to deliver that work. But thank you so much for your question. Thank you so much um, for sharing your story with us, Asha. Um, as a member of the Afghan diaspora, I definitely resonate um, with some of the experiences that you've shared um, and really being able to um, still remain connected to cultures um, as we're sitting at the intersections of these many identities and experiences. Um, and so with that in this, um, especially um, the intergenerational piece that you've um, spoken about, I actually wanted to turn this over to Deepak um, to share um, some, some of the intergenerational and intercultural aspects of, of the work that he's been doing um, in being able to make knowledge more accessible to people and some of the lessons that he's learned in that process um, that the open community can adopt in their respective uh, Thank contexts. you, Busha, for your question. Well, one of the most fun things about documenting human wisdom across age groups is that you break some of the most conventional stereotypes, one of which is that the older you are, the more gray hair you have, the more wise you become. I think that's the myth we need to debunk a really long time coming because uh, wisdom or knowledge in, in that uh, pursuit is not limited to age. Experiences, and with more age comes experience. But I have life lessons that I've documented of very young children, a five-year-old girl once said to me, when you are done using the jar, remember to close the lid. That's the life lesson of a five-year-old. And to a five-year-old audience, that's a beautiful life lesson because that knowledge helps other five-year-olds build uh, your uh, skill set, your you know, heuristic approach or your open knowledge in that sense. There's a six-year-old boy last year in Belgium, I was teaching in Antwerp, and he said to me, my life lesson, Deepak, is, before you learn how to ride a bike, 
learn where the breaks are. Now that's a six-year-old boy telling you about in his figurative uh, or literal sense about the bike he's riding. But in, in a more metaphoric sense, he's talking about young adults and adults across the world learning to create boundaries and learning to define the limits of what consists of failure. So I think knowledge particularly can be admired, can be appreciated, and can be absorbed across generations. We don't have to wait for somebody to reach a particular age group to use them or to uh, be able to use their knowledge for informing us better. So that's one, I would say, primary thing that I've been able to see. The other, I would say, is uh, not feeling absolutely protective about uh, or insecure about the knowledge you have because uh, in India, we, we have an old proverb that we say that knowledge shared is doubled. And, you know, um, in, in that pursuit, we feel like from very young age, we are actually embedded with that thought. The more knowledge you share, the more knowledge grows. And my, my mother uh, often used to say, if you have one rupee and somebody else has one rupee and you exchange it, you still have one rupee. But if you have an idea and somebody else has an idea and you share that, now you have two ideas each to take that and apply that to a creative uh, open source, creative commons, open source, open access learning platform actually helps you feel more empowered uh, and less intimidated about what you can do with knowledge. It is to empower other people. And I think to answer uh, your question lastly would be the perspective that it's not just a handful of people who are stars in the world, you know. We, we are looking at building through the open access channel a constellation of learning. And when we are talking about a constellation, we have to treat, treat every individual player as a star, as somebody who's important, and then see it as a whole, as a collective of meaning and imperative value. When we're able to create that, I think the world in general will have more peace, will have more empathy, because we will not evaluate people on the basis of their bank balance or their economic viability or their uh, academic um, excellence, but rather for who they are and what they're willing to share. And so often in my classrooms, my first question to my students when I ask them to introduce themselves is, who are you and what are you willing to share? And that answer dramatically changes how they see themselves in the classroom. So my encouragement with uh, organizational leaders, corporate uh, heads, teachers in classrooms is to actually um, inspire young people with the question of sharing and not being stringent and dismissive of, of what that generosity can bring. Thank you for sharing those really profound lessons. I think that it's something that many members of the open community can definitely um, adopt into the work that they're doing. Um, and in particular, as you're working with young people, I would also suggest um, making sure that you um, give proper attribution. Creative Commons definitely um, does this with its licensing. So if anybody needs to learn more about that, they can access the resources through their site. Um, but making sure that young people are also um, getting attribution for their work. I often find in the spaces that I work um, that they aren't being um, given that proper um, recognition. Um, and therefore you've seen like the undervaluing of that um, knowledge over time. Um, and I think also connecting it with the, the idea that um, this isn't a zero sum game. Um, that's often, I think, something that contributes to the security that we see around the world. Um, and with that, um, I would like to ask Leonardo a question because he does work in the peace and security space. Um, I think um, some of the work that you do is um, very unique in the space of peace building and that um, while it was trying to make, you know, um, uh, peace agreements accessible to people, it was also using visual arts and other forms of um, creative expression to really advance peace in a in a meaningful way. Um, so I want to hear a little bit more about um, how that really um, that process emerged um, in the in the context that you work in, and what happens when um, you know you're um, dealing with communities that have um, uh, especially like uh, concerns about insecurity, um, about sharing their um, identities online, for example, or their work online, uh, or in digital spaces, or even in physical spaces where there could be um, a threat to their safety and security. Yes, thank you so much for that question, Bushra. I think it's 
really an important one, a necessary one. Mm, I would like to start uh, with the um, with the perspective that art can give you a kind of protection that many other means might not. And I think the wonderful thing about art is that um, you can have your, let's say, alternative identity uh, with which you create your poems, uh, your visual films, uh, different kind of uh, communication mechanisms. Uh, and then like, because it's impossible to track down who's the real author, you still get your message out there, but you don't receive the potential threats that it entails. So, so for us, we have seen that uh, art really gives you that particular edge. Uh, and then you, you have different kind of creations, right? Like when it comes to street art, for example, if you create a collective mural, let's say with 20 people, um, you can see the final result at the end, but you don't really know who particularly was involved or engaged in that process. Um, and as such, you're still building a community, you're still having a group who, who feels that they have ownership um, from what they develop, but at the same time, they are not uh, constrained and they're not threatened by by the potential consequences of, of doing that. Uh, first, because it was done collectively, so it's harder to, to track down uh, one individual. But then secondly, because um, there's a sense of being anonymous when, when, when you're doing this um, collectively. Uh, it's, it's a group that, that's pushing that forward, uh, but that group can adopt any identity that you want. So um, you, you, you can make sure that it's uh, harder to, to track down. Um, and then another point on how um, the art can, can also help to, to get these messages um, across. Um, many times what, what we do is, um, for example, collecting testimonials of, of people who, who are living in an area of conflict. Um, and, and of course, make, making sure that they, they receive all protection needed. So, so that's a really private space and like nothing goes out of it. Um, and then again, like we, we tell them like, hey, so would you like this message to, to reach a wider audience? And, and many times they say yes. So in these cases, what we do is, um, well, ma making who they are anonymous and, and then make sure that a network of, of people, like for example, who went to Escort La Paz, they're able to, uh, to carry out this message and particularly people who are in spaces where they're not threatened. So this way, even if there's someone in the rural area of Colombia in Cauca, who wants to send a message. Um, then like someone from Argentina who still is part of the network can spread that message and he's not going to suffer that, that risk of, of getting that message across, neither the person in the rural region. And, and in this way, by creating uh, collaboration and, and these potential bridges, um, as Deepak was mentioning, uh, going beyond the zero sum game, uh, we can really uh, uh, start to, to create these spaces for uh, collective creation of peace uh, and really protecting uh, people who are engaged there. Yeah, definitely that idea of collectively building peace is um, one that resonates with me um, and really promoting collective action. And then on the other side of openness also, um, really thinking about um, the agency of communities and allowing them to decide what they do and um, uh, don't want to share. Um, and that's a really key part of it. And especially as we look at um, communities that have been historically and contemporarily marginalized um, as a result of racism, discrimination, oppression, um, and uh, colonial acts of violence, um, that this is uh, something that's really important. And I've seen this, um, especially in some of the work that's being developed by indigenous communities in particular, and how they're leading in this space. Uh, I uh, 
uh, was really um, privileged to be privy to some of the work that they've been leading on um, adopting um, something known as the care principles when it comes to data in particular. Um, so when we think about like open data, um, we need to really decolonize our understanding of what, of what open data is because just um, making data available to people online without securitizing it um, is something that's uh, uh, prob problematic and in ways that we don't even ask people before we're sharing it and in, in the ways that they want it to be shared um, with development of artificial intelligence and technologies such as these um, there's actually a greater risk of perpetuating some of these harms uh, recreating uh, systems of inequity and so i think it's really important for us to really be centering that co-creation collaboration process um, and i would definitely encourage um, members of the open community to contribute to UNESCO's um, process on developing recommendations on open science um, and really um, championing um, uh, liberatory understandings of open science, um, ones that, uh, again, center those traditional knowledges and communities, and maybe also thinking about how um, open knowledge, open access, open culture, open data um, connect with this idea of peace building. Um, I know that it's something that um, many of the communities that I interact with don't necessarily think of. Um, they um, think about peace building, um, this idea of like openness to knowledge um, and um, really all the different ways that we can learn from each other and co-create the, the vision that we have for peace in our community. Um, and I think that's a key aspect of the work. And I'm really i um, honored to um, be joined by um, the three of you, um, Asha, Deepak, and Leonardo. Um, I've been inspired by your work for several years now, and it's been um, really humbling to be able to um, share the space um, and be able to, to really co-create, um, I think, a vision um, for people to, to carry forward in their own work, um, and also encourage them to share some of their experiences, um, both in the, in the chat here, but also connecting with, with each other through uh, the, the community that Creative Commons is developing and then looking to expand that community um, to really invite people into that space um, and then beyond kind of inclusion, um, thinking about um, advancing justice in particular. So we don't want to, you know, um, expose people to greater harms, but when we think about like building this more equitable community together, what does that, what does that mean for us? Um, and so coming with that like understanding of respect, of equity, of justice, of peace, um, and really centering that um, as we go forward, I think is really important um, for building that culture of peace, as I said. Um, if you'd like to follow any of our works, um, please um, check out some of the links um, in the, the chat um, and um, please feel free to follow um, us on, on Twitter or um, other so social media, we're all available. And I, I'd encourage our speakers to also um, share some of the links um, to their socials in the chat, or you can also connect with us via the um, the Global Summit platform as well. Um, so thank you, um, Creative Commons, for inviting us to um, share our today. Um, I'd really um, um, like to encourage people to, to carry these um, lessons forward in their lives um, and to start a dialogue in their own, own communities about um, the importance of openness and decolonizing openness and um, uh, the open community. Um, to ensure that we're uh, building an equitable and just vision for peace, um, both for the present and the future.